She is the founder and querio of Shesling Incorporated, a global diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting company. Chesleen Pierre Paul works with organizations to help them expand their DEI initiatives and do their part to make the world more inclusive. They did it all with gumshoe perseverance. Pierre Paul speaks five languages and has been featured on Brains with Oprah, Le Press, Omni TV, and is a 2022 Black Excellent Award winner. Please welcome Chesleen Pierre Paul. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so tell us about your roots. Were you born and raised in Montreal? So my roots, my parents are political refugees. They came here from Amnesty International. I was born and raised here on unceded indigenous lands, Jojage, Montreal, as we call it. And I've had the opportunity to travel a little bit, went to Haiti when I was younger. And yeah, that's a little bit in terms of where I come from. My roots are in Haiti. And it's informed a lot of how I've lived very multiculturally with a family that was from all over the world, growing up in a house full of cousins and aunties and uncles. So whenever they would migrate here to Canada, we all lived in the same house until people were bored to settle on their own. So yeah, very multicultural family. Yes. So French came naturally. Yeah, because of where we were is the second language. My native African indigenous language is Haitian Creole. Second is French and then third English. I grew up around Spanish as well because when my parents were fleeing the country, they lived in Dominican Republic as well. So they picked it up there. And when we had other families who had a similar journey, also spoke Spanish. So in the house, we've had on average three to four languages spoken at all times. Wow. Sounds like your parents have a heck of a story too. Yes, indeed. And I only know just that tinsy bit of it because it keeps on expanding every time I ask more questions growing up. And a lot of times when they've seen a few things, mm -hmm. they don't really want to talk about it. It's too traumatic. I think, well, for them too, they're very grounded in their spiritual beliefs and it gives them an anchor to be able to release their trauma. And I feel that at the point that we are in a relationship they are able to have a sense of safety that they didn't have at the time. So it's easier. Now they want to talk about it. And also, I think we've reached all in the family level of maturity, like all the cousins, siblings growing up that were able to receive that information. But definitely when I was younger, it was not a space where collectively we could have those conversations. And certainly the older generations, they didn't talk about a whole lot. It isn't nice to talk about. It's very mm -hmm. hard for them. So when did you take that first step to reveal who you were and did your family always know? I mean, not everybody knows in the family because logistically they're more than I can count. And also I feel not everybody is entitled to your truth. Not everybody deserves to know, nobody can handle it. There is also that element of discernment and the entitlement that some people can feel to you. The kids took it very fairly well. Like, it didn't change anything about our dynamics. And I also have what I call my chosen family and my soul family. So we're not blood related. I knew from day one, I guess more for the biological family. My mom, it's new information to her and she's been very supportive. And my dad has its own way of processing it. And I respect them and their differences, but I would say it hasn't changed the nature of a report. And it's also not like they will talk about this all the time. You know what I mean? So I feel as a family, we've grown a lot enough. So I would have that support system that I could count on. As I said, though, not everybody knows. And I don't feel like it's everybody's business to know or, you know, to, to handle. And if it were to come to it, I'm very clear on the boundaries that I draw between what I call blood family per se, and what I call biological accidents. So we may be related, but that doesn't make us family per se. So those that I consider family know, and have been supportive, and it just confirmed the reason why we choose to be in each other's lives. That's wonderful yeah. that they're so yeah. supportive of you. That's huge. So many people don't have that. Did you always feel like you were an activist? What did you think you were going to be doing when you were a kid? 
I've had so many different versions of my tomorrows. And I feel that in many regards, the life that I'm creating for myself is that blueprint where I don't have to choose one identity on one version of my dream or my passion. And on some level, I do feel like I'm answering all those dreams that I had growing up as a child as to what I was going to do. But I've done dancing, choreography, singing. I would write a lot. I wrote poems and I did spoken words. I wanted to go into law, which I did for a minute. And then when I was in my law classes, I ended up writing and translating my notes into German and Spanish. And I realized my calling is more heavily located in languages, not in a way that means I could never do law, just to say that right now, that's the focus of what I'm just called to do. So I feel I've lived many lives vicariously and practically. And that's why it was important for me to create a business, to be able to have the flexibility, to be in control, to honor all those different facets of me and to create a holistic way that would help me structurally have the capacity to address all those different elements of curiosity within me without being all over the place, without burning out, without being over capacity and without being scattered. So even when I look at my work and the DEI space, it's very creative. I create presentations, I do content, I do public speaking, which takes me back to my stage. And when we're working with communities, there are different cultural practices as well. So there's a space where my dancing can be reignited and my singing in different scenarios. So for me, it was important to have a bigger picture in mind and to think and to act strategically. And within that, to see where does my multi-passion gets to be expressed and it's still structured and it's still organized. So I feel that I'm living a lot of the different versions of my dreams going up just in different ways. And the business is a great vessel for that. And also making sure that I do have a rich life that's fulfilling with the kids and then my chosen and soul family. We do a lot of those things as well together, like karaoke and all those, those other things. So with the business side of things, we don't always think we're going to get into business. When did you decide that DEI was going to be the route that you were going to take? Yeah, it took me a minute to get there. I feel I was tiptoeing around it because for the longest time, I would work a lot with nonprofits and activist groups and different collectives. And then I landed into specializing in decolonization work. And that's through that vessel channel that I was introduced to DEI. I guess I needed to have all those different experiences as both somebody was a beneficiary and as much as somebody was delivering it because they all pulled at me different, but I noticed there were gaps in each industry. And I think that once I had been around the block and I realized I had exhausted the spectrum of potential and possible that appealed to me and to my sensibilities, I needed a moment of self-reflection because it was a restlessness still that I had, even though I've had, I've done all those beautiful things and projects, it feels incomplete. And the part where the business kicks in for me is to understand that's my way of addressing all the systemic and structural gaps that I've picked up on from working with all those different partners and clients and stakeholders and me being able to create my own solution, my own methodology of DEI work is my way to be able to organically recreate the best parts of those projects, but with full creative control. And also from the perspective of, I want to do work that matters and I want to have real tangible impact. And that's my way of answering all those gaps. So it took me several years of work. And as you said, it's not something I had planned out to do and I wanted to be effective. And I realized that the quickest path to efficiency in my life was to be the lead on those initiatives. How do you get businesses to listen, especially when they're run by mostly cis white men? <laughs> Very good question. I mean, it really depends, you know. So for instance, there is that element of culture. Right. So when we think of an organization as a top down vertical, that's very hierarchical. Yes, there is definitely a legacy that exists in management culture where some people have a lot of resistance and that resistance comes a lot from basically not understanding the business impact and the business value of DEI. It sounds very abstract. For them, it may sound like a distraction as well. It may sound like something that we need to do, but it's not going to generate any revenue or impact that is tangible or that carries enough of a financial component that we can legitimize this as part of our corporate planning, priorities, agenda, or bottom line. 
So I feel what helps is when we look beyond the management, right? And we're able to really understand what is the work that they do? What, what are their own individual priorities beyond DEI? What is their perception of their needs? And what is also their misconception of DEI? So for me, it helps to have a full picture before I come in with like DEI strategies, because the way that I function, it's all about efficiency. So once I understand the truest needs that you have, it's very evident to me all the different ways that DEI can be organically part of the solutions that you haven't thought to consider because people tend to put DEI in a little box, right? So it's something they think typically of PR and marketing. We have a couple black and brown bodies on a poster and then we did the job. We changed up the lingo on the website and now we're inclusive. Their metrics are extremely abstract. They are not tangible. They have nothing to do with finances. They don't align with their sales revenue strategies at all. So they set themselves up for failure, but then they blame DEI for it, right? So there's a lot of strategic thinking, but ultimately implementation that doesn't happen. And usually within a year of promoting a DI agenda, most organizations, less than 9% of them are able to effectively implement them. So for me, what's important is to understand what matters to them and to understand what is the unmet DI potential that they're sitting on today, but they don't realize because their mind doesn't work on that frequency. And then once you understand how they speak and how they think and also what matters to them, it's very clear to me how the business impact of DEI is there. And it's just a matter of doing that translation for them. Of course, if you're coming into a culture that's super, super resistant, there's a level of resistance with which you can work. And there's one with which you can't because it's like you're trying to convert. I'm not in the conversion business, like Liz Nicole says, right? So for me, what matters is if we have enough people in the team that are willing and able to do the work, that just by working with those select few, you can generate incredible impact and then they become your greatest champions across the organization. So I need to have a minimum, viable minimum team that's pre-committed with whom I can work and do amazing work. And then it's going to help thaw the resistance of the people that are still on the fence and they don't really get it. But then the idea is I bring in results and they're quantifiable and they're tangible. And it's not a poster, it's not a policy or anything like that. So I would say that resistance is good in my line of work. It's how much of it there is and around what specific part of the work. And then beyond that is who in the team is willing and able to do it. I can work with that, but that's the minimum that I need or else it, it's very confrontational and it's ultimately working with somebody who's an active disbeliever of what you do. And there's a lot of sabotage and issues that can undermine the work that can be done. And that's not viable for anyone. Well, and it comes down to money talks, right? Exactly. Um, let's play with some numbers because even if only 3% of our 40 million people in Canada are LGBTQ, that's a huge chunk of mm -hmm. chips, a few million. <laughs> yeah. As you said, when you look at the numbers, even when you look at the, you know, the GPD for, in terms that quantifies the potential of a marketplace that is queer, a marketplace that is woman-led, a marketplace as is, you know, racialized, that is indigenous, individually, those statistics are always numbered around trillions individually. So we don't yeah. account for intersectional identities, right? So the potential is there. The issue is few people who are fluent in DEI are also fluent in economics. So the, those two never overlap. So that's why for me, my interest is we're aligning profits with social impact. And that's a new take on this very, you know, pre-existing conversation. The community, it always baffled me when you look sports teams, for example, back a decade and a half ago, where they would disregard half their kids and always think that, well, when you look in the stands, I don't know about you, but I see like half the people in the stands are women. <laughs> and depending on which arena or which stadium you're at, they're all multicultured. <laughs> so it only makes sense that your organization should reflect what's outside your window, <laughs> mm -hmm. but we're a long way from going there. And it's good that we have people like you to kind of help show the way. It probably would not be as effective the work that you do if you were a cis white 
male or cis white woman either. So, because <laughs> I think there's an expertise. Not and a that we can't be that. advocates, but it's exactly. Just, yeah. Yeah. No, it's different. And as you said, for me, the ultimate thing, it's not necessarily on the surface levels, diversity, it's how we think. Because there's such a thing as tokens, right? Having people who look like difference, but then they reproduce the same systemic issues, right? Just because I'm a bit more melanated doesn't mean that ideologically, I don't think like whiteness. So it's to make sure that in a room full of humans, no matter their skin color or gender, do we think different? So when, as you said, when people are dismissive of half of their demographics when it comes to clients, partners, allies, et cetera, that part of it is when they're in a room full of their team, they all think the same. So it means that every time you're bumping into an issue, you probably have only one way to address a problem. When you're in a room and you have true diversity of thought, it means that you have as many different ways of tackling the same recurring problem as you have people in the room and potentially more. Like when I come in, I carry the history, the legacy, the knowledges of several different communities. So with me in the room, we have the equivalent of 10 other thinkers that are sitting with me, right? So diversity, it's also that mechanism of how you self-reflect, how you anticipate, manage problems. And also because an issue that one community has been dealing with for the first time, my people have been dealing with this for millennia. So the level of expertise that we bring in, it's incomparable, right? So there are many nuances and the conversation that are not being had because people are thinking DI 101 and they look at surface level thinking. They don't look at in-depth analysis. So that's what I mean. And they look at, you know, innovation revenues and cash flow per employee goes up to 2.3%, you know, two, two and a half more. When you have that level of diversity, they talk about how the most racially diverse teams in corporate, you know, they can 15 fold their revenue because of that. Those are people that are at the top tier of what I'm, just, you know, I'm talking about. But even if you're not even there yet, there's so much benefit because we think different. My community knows how to thrive and survive off of almost nothing. So if we have half of the resources available to a privileged community who doesn't have to think as strategically because they incarnate privilege, imagine what we can do when we come together. So that's another part of the conversation that people are very dismissive of, as you were saying, because ultimately we have people who come from the same group experience talking about a diversity that they cannot understand, as opposed to let's have that conversation with the actual experts. And that is what is going to elucidate and elucidate and illuminate a lot of this, the solutions that we're not in a position to, to envision. DEI is being seen and heard. So if all of a sudden you picked up a phone and ignored that person and whatever they said, just it was like they're not in the room, they're going to feel unseen and unheard and they're going to mm -hmm. start getting pissed off. And if it's somebody that has a product that they want to buy, they're not going to buy that product because that's how the company treated them. So mm -hmm. if there's a way to translate that into that boardroom, you see some of the the corporate executives or the high level, they don't seem to care what the future is or what it's about, but I guess that's why we need you help them do that. <laughs> so what are some good DEI practices that you can instill with some of these corporations? Yeah, the analogy that came to mind as a metaphor, right, is every time you walk into a space, you only interact with people that look exactly like you. Right. And that limits drastically the field of potential partnerships, collaborations, opportunities that you can generate because you're basically looking for a twin. And even within your community, that entails discrimination. Because what if they're neurodivergent? What if they're queer? What if they're a woman? What if they're woman presenting? So all that dwindles down the scope of who you actually get into partnership with. And it's a completely non-rational exercise, right? So that's a very obvious thing to do. Like even your parents, maybe now they're no longer your demographics because of age, right? So it makes it, you live in such an insulated and small world. It's not functional and it's not remarkably sustainable either. So to the point of what you said, what does it look like in action? Of course, from one organization to the next, it's different. But something that I love to do is if we're looking at how they target their clients as a case in point, I will just go through the analysis with them and say, listen, you have exactly the same profile, but now they are Spanish speaking. Now they are Black. Now they are queer. Every time you've applied this 
very restrictive and discriminatory version of your client profile, you have alienated 10 different markets in your given region where you lead your operations. So as you said, that's a very clear way to go, oh, wow. So the criteria that you are most dependent on to create gen business opportunities out of your current market, they're so biased that they eliminate automatically probably 90% of the next best opportunities that you could have had. So it's this analogy of you're sitting on this gold mine, right? And you don't realize it because your blind spot is where you're sitting. So as you said, having me come in makes it clearer, but that's been one such example. You are not your you know, That A hundred percent. That's another way to put it, right? And if you are, then that limits your potential to scale. That limits your potential to stay in business. You know what I mean? So that's an, also another metaphor. And for some people, I've had people that I've helped get their next clients, they were in the same building. But because they were just so narrow-minded, they would totally dismiss this person. They didn't know what they did. And the more I understood what they needed, the more this person was very self-evident. But it's all a matter of perspective. So it's not necessarily bringing new people, is having a greater awareness of what was always right in front of you. You didn't do anything, but now that you have discernment, the next part of the process with me is to help you be able to communicate and to build trust, to build a relationship that will be mutually empowering for all. And that's where cultural sensitivity training and things of that nature are kicking. But the first is it becomes very obvious when you know that your bias are so ingrained <laughs> that you thought that this is being targeting. You're not targeting, you're dismissing, you're alienating, you're excluding in many ways. So that's a little bit of an education to do first. Do you ever feel disenchanted with having all these forces of late wanting to take the world back to 1910 and take away everybody's rights except for the cis white male? I feel exalted and, you know, disillusioned frequently in a matter of days, a matter of weeks. And I feel it's also what we focus on and who, where do we get our news from? I'm also very mindful of that. So there are the colonial and anti-colonial news outlet that I check out there because I want to hear the news from all over the world. And in the same time frame that we have this drastic regression to violation and denial of human rights, we have great advancements that are being generated in communities that don't have the same level of clout and media representation. And I feel we always live in a paradox. So I want to feed my mind with the advancement of those people and leverage my space to bring more representativity to their work because those news are also reductive in terms of what they show up, they choose to show to us. But yeah, I feel the more you educate yourself, there need, there will be that tension and how I answer it is an action. But as they say, the more educated and self-aware and system aware you become, anger is a very organic and healthy way to process things. I just don't want to be caged in that space. So that's why I have my healing, I have my community, I have other things. What are some things we need to know as workers and citizens that might help us move the needle of DEI? The way that I look at it is DEI helps you accelerate whatever vision, goal, or purpose you have. Whatever goal or aspiration or dream or project you're leading you're always going to be limited if the only version of a people or humanity you seek to serve is another secret version of yourself. If you're leading an organization and you have different goals or we want to hit this target for the next quarter, it's going to be limited to who looks like you. It defeats the purpose of your project or your intervention. So for me, DI is the secret sauce of how do I accelerate the things that I'm passionate about the most? And there is also, as I was sh sharing before, a clear social economic part to that, but there is also this healing aspect. And I feel when you're a leader and you get, the more decentered you become, the more powerful you become as a voice of change. Because when you sit in a room, you represent not people like you, you represent a whole network, a whole community. So by having you, we access a different part of the world. So I feel that's a way that people can draw inspiration for DI work for themselves. So how can we be advocates, the cis white women and men, how can we be advocates for the LGBTQ communities just on a daily basis? I think there are a variety of ways, right? For one, 
when there are so many initiatives out there, but I feel it's it ultimately needs to have a financial component because if I am intellectually richer, but I'm just as poor materially, I'm not going to be able to achieve a standard of decent living that should be equitable for all. So sometimes we do feel good activism. We feel good after it, but the measurability of our impact is very scarce. So for me, it's looking at projects that have to do with particularly economic empowerment or to bring that up to the radar of considerations for projects. So there are different things you can do, like you can sponsor different children or people. I feel that money is a great equalizer in this sense because there's a direct correlation between accessibility to education, safe spaces, things of that nature. Because talking a good talk is not going to help nobody walk it. So for me, it's where do you put your money at? That's part of the commitment. The other thing is look for tangible change. You don't want just the lingo on the surface level of a policy to change and then call yourself inclusive and you did it. It's what can be done better. So as I said, what can help somebody achieve greater empowerment? Maybe it's to help them find greater jobs, higher paying jobs, jobs in fields that they actually want to do, as opposed to be used by the system to fill in jobs that nobody else wants to do. And then, oh yeah, we're inclusive because now we have you know non-binary and queer people doing it. So I think there's a level of intention and then you automate it. Like for me, there are different sponsorship that I have. I put my money there. It's automated. That's part of my integrity. Then when there is an initiative that I can support, I can help them put together that socioeconomic agenda, or I can bring that up to their consideration, or I can just invest in initiatives, volunteer here and there. It needs to be an action verb. It cannot be just, I feel good and I'm inclusive. And even the word ally, the community would tell you if you are. It's not a self-appointed moniker that you can have to sure. appease your fragility, right? That's not how it works. And it's how you raise, it's how you parent, right? Do you speak about this with your family? Do you educate them about it? And when you do, does that change how you do what you do as a family? There's so many different ways that it becomes organic. Do you volunteer with your kids in different centers? If you're an educator, can you bring what your work to a different youth queer space? Like for me, there's an evolution where you start is going to be individualized, but when you land, it needs to be scalable. So for me, when I was working at university, I was coaching the youth in a center. Then after my shift, I found this beautiful space and I would take them physically and that would be part of the education, bring them physically there. You need to go the extra mile. Doesn't need any to be complicated, but you can't just settle for a cookie answer than to feel good in your fragility about your contribution, right? So get creative with it. Yeah, do the work. Yeah, it needs to be an action. And also who you hang with, right? One of the things I always found puzzling, I know that there are some communities that were raised, born and raised in where they're somewhat segregated, whether they're all white or all black or all whatever. But I think the onus is on us to step outside that community and meet other people, have them into our homes, go into their homes and get to know them as people <laughs> so that we're not you know, separated all the time, even if you just did that with one person, it's one step. But I love this. What are some of the things that you have coming up that we should know about? And what's next for you? I have different projects I'm working on. I'm finalizing my master's on this topic to help people put together effective solutions that generate tangible impact for communities. But in terms of, for me, I write articles about this and I do videos so people can get educated following me on LinkedIn in case they're curious. And what's next? I'm just working with my existing clients and creating more impact across institutions. And if they're curious, I feel my social will give them a sense of ongoing projects but right now I'm really leaning into different collaborations to bring this conversations to spaces where historically you never hear of it. So working with one of my friends is a scientist and he specializes in quantum mechanics and physics. And so we talk about how do you decolonize the work that he does when he talks about the cosmos and it talks about Adam. But again, my thing is how do we make this practical and impactful? The other day I was working with my alma mater and we co-wrote this piece around how do we decolonize higher education? What does DI look like in a classroom? 
I spoke from the perspective of what is missing. So for me, it's always an action verb. It's always something that is very simple to do and effective. And it's also us projecting ourselves across generations, as opposed to we want a one and done quick solution and answer today, but we need to understand it's a systemic problem. It requires a systemic solution and it's been built across generations. So it will take generations as well to disestablish it. Thank you so much for coming on my show. Sure. My pleasure.